piece of metal board in service? Uh, well, that would be in China, I would have supposed, and that um, history goes back 40, 50 years in North America, it would be probably six, seven years in Canada, it would be some of the projects in Alberta. Um, not much locally here for things that have been around with the test of time, so we have to rely on projects elsewhere. And then by extension to that, it says you have 30 year guarantee. <coughs> well, Magnum uh, provides that warranty, and that is covered by an insurance policy. So I'm guessing that the insurance company had something to say about that. But it's not just a company guarantee that is backed up uh, with an insurance policy. Yeah? I think you mentioned it has a cost of a dollar a square foot for the material. Yeah. How does it, when, when, you, when, you, when you take into account the complete application of the finish, finishing of the material, how does it compare with the uh, five-eighths gypsum board, mud and tape on the wall? We haven't done enough projects yet to get a, um, enough labor components to give a proper installed price. Uh, we've only got a few of them. Um, I know from the drywall contractors that 40% of drywall labor is mud bead tape, and we reduce a lot of that. Um, when you factor in that you don't need a separate waste stream if you weren't going to recycle and you don't have to have the tapers coming back three times. There are benefits, but I'm not sure exactly how much. I know watching the Hamilton Child Care, a lot of cabinets, a lot of grab bars, they spend days putting back in. And it, yeah? So I, mean, are, are the, uh, I, I would imagine that the, uh, the drywall subtrades are, uh, would love to be using, using this, or are you getting resistance from Generally not. Uh, we have uh, showed several drywall contractors at places like Dryco or CCS and generally they've looked at it and said, yeah, we can score and snap, we can do this. At the Richmond job, um, the way that these things worked out, I was given like two days notice to get the board and then I showed up there, I got four white hats from the city of Richmond, I tried to get a drywall contractor to use a table saw, that didn't work so well. Um, so there is definitely a bit of a learning curve to get a border to use it, but we've had several architects listen to the presentation and say, does that mean I don't need borders? I would prefer to train a carpenter, <laughs> frankly, than a border. Can you, can you use tape your joints if you want? Pardon? Can you tape your joints if you want? Yes, you can. You, uh, we recommend fiberglass tape. The Richmond job in particular, this is a, an ideal sort of case in point. We had the instructions, I went out to talk to the contractor several times, I gave them drawings, and they didn't follow any of them. So they ended up putting it up, the, the, the general contractor ended up putting up the boards up, joining it on studs, treating it basically like gypsum. So the drywall taper came in, and they put the fiberglass tape, and they mudded the joints. And I talked to him after, and he actually had an easier job doing that than with the paper face gypsum, in part because um, that's a much smoother finish and so the tooling uh, glides easier on it, it's easier to feather out the mud because you're not going to sand through the surface. You could use a palm sander if you want. Yeah? What was the joint filler you used in the, in the video? What was that? That was a, it's called Rapid Set One Pass. It is a finely ground hydraulic cement product. I think Target has a similar thing, Flexcrete. Um, it's a Portland cement based. Uh, this material has been tested with a variety of Portland cement based sort of fillers or grouts. Um, it also works with, um, well, all the drywall muds that we've tried, uh, although you would not get the same characteristics at the end. The drywall mud would be the weak link in the, in the chain. Um, when we uh, went over this with um, uh, Morrison Hirschfeld, they sort of thought, well, you know, maybe the the flexible, like a painter's caulking or something as well, would also do uh, a suitable job inside. One of the things we're trying to limit is the effect of micro-cracking uh, if we don't have tape. And, um, and so by isolating it from the structure, that's our hypothesis, and connecting the boards together, that that would limit micro-cracking caused by movement in the substructure. One last question. Have you, uh, thinking of typical applications where in, you would put gypsum board on top of a polyethylene 
paper to tell her, how do you, how do you measure the uh, vapor permeance of the material to see whether it's less than a gypsum board, perhaps to the point where it could act as a vapor retarder? It's been fully tested and it's very permeable. Very permeable. Highly permeable. So you do need a vapor barrier. You would need a vapor barrier if that's your, if that's your assembly, yes. Easy. If you want a wall that breathes. So uh, a, a lot of the Hemp Creek people are very big adopters of this because they want a wall assembly that breathes. And, and we've got, I'll forward you the test results. There's, it's complicated. There's several different ways to measure permeance. And so we've been tested to four different ways. Well, again, which one are we measuring? Because I've got numbers that go all the way up to 800. And I'm not sure, honestly, what exactly they're measuring. I'm not sure whether I've got that here in the book or not. But I can forward that to you, and you can look at it yourself. Because there's SI units, there's metric units, and then there's two ways to measure it. So I've got four different answers for you. Uh, when you, you said you hung cabinets and they didn't need to use backing, you can hang cabinets right directly to it? Correct. Do you know what pull-ups you can get with screws on that? Um, we've done the official pull-through test, which is an ASTM test, and that's 174 pounds or something. I haven't actually quantified the pull-out. I did the field test of hanging nine gallons of water on an eight mil board for five months. Um, so I've done the field test, but we haven't done that officially and had it uh, accredited. So I don't have a maximum. We didn't. I didn't do that to failure either. So I don't know how high it will go. As a platic, I've always been a little bit concerned about the fiber cement products because um, they work pretty well. They don't get too terribly wet. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, we've taken samples of fiber cement, put them in a bucket overnight, and they just go to mush. Right. Uh, I suppose you're doing the same thing. This, what happens to this when you throw it? Well, I've had one piece go through my dishwasher for eight cycles so far. Yeah. I've had another piece sit in my shower for six months. I've had stuff on my deck since last July. Um, so at this point, I see no degradation to water. Take the sample, put it in a bucket. Yeah. It, it does have cellulose fiber mm -hmm. within Correct. it as a binder or a reinforcing matrix or something. It gives it more faster, better faster mm -hmm. running capacity, I understand. And yet, <coughs> it's still water resistant, doesn't support deterioration. Correct. Mm -hmm. Even through, like the experiment that I went through, was soaking it and then wrapping it in saran wrap and freezing it. And the secret sauce of some 2% of volume. Um, Talk mostly. Um, that's what I'm aware of. Uh, I'm not sure what the other materials might be. There. Corn starch, ring a bell? I, I just don't know. Uh, so it's secret. There you go. It's the secret sauce. I'm also noticing that this is a masker's coating, I gather. You mentioned the masker. It's coming off. Well, those were done uh, as a very first go around. Sure. And it was put on without cleaning the board in. Yeah, minus 15 degree temperatures at their factory. It's dust. Yeah. So they were, and that board has been kicking around with me now since last October. And this is probably the 30th demonstration we've done. And Masco has tested it in their lab, and they've given us a written uh, warranty. So we, we're really good if you want to test stuff. We had uh, Acro Labs try their stuff as well. They've given us the letter, but we also had cases where it wasn't applied properly, where the Acrolab's acrylic membrane came off as well. But is that on the rough side or the smooth side, that one? It's on the smooth. Yeah, so Amasco prefers that we put their product on the rough side. They've tested both. They've said that both work, but the warranty requires it to be put on the rough side, which gives a, a mechanical advantage as well. Do you have any problems with effervescence when you use this in no site application, or is it how's it changed the format? I haven't seen any. Um, I'm not sure exactly what effervescence, what it is chemically, and whether those ingredients are in the product. Um, I haven't heard or seen any of that. Effervescence comes from soluble salts. Is it any easier could effervesce if you had free, if you had free maggots? Or the chlorine's being 
it, it'd be the chloride part, and that's back to that um, wanting to have a complete reaction, and if there's too much free chloride ions, there's um, and the, the white papers that I've read, um, they only say prolonged version. I've never seen one that says, you know, 12 months, 16 months. The closest I can find with magnesium oxychloride cements in general is a, a comment saying you wouldn't use it for a bridge foundation. But we haven't been able to quantify exactly what the risk might be. So could we, do you think we could use this below grade, say, protecting insulation at bridge foundation walls? I think that this MIP would make an ideal foundation. <coughs> yes, uh, like in the preserved wood foundation replacement, I think this would be uh, superior to that. And we would be wanting a membrane or something on it, a, a self-adhesive membrane, but um, from what we've seen so far, uh, I've seen no indication of degradation from uh, either the field test, and, and you can refer to the ASTM test. I don't think there is a test for soil contact, but there is definitely tests for water. Long term, I mean, a lot of the ASTM tests don't tell you a lot how it actually performs. So yes. And it's going to be done a lot of drones tests against the ground and stuff. Yes. But, you know, a new product like this, there, I guess the question is, why has, why is it just taking the last few years to be introduced in the North American market? I can answer that one. Um, so if we trace back the history, there definitely is history in the pictures you've seen that have magnesium-based cement a couple thousand years ago, and some of those structures are still there today. It sort of got forgotten. The Stanislav Sorel reinvented it 1462. That's 60 years after Asplin invented Portland cement. So Portland cement had a 60-year head start. Uh, gypsum has been used as long as um, the magnesium oxide cement. So the Greeks used gypsum, plaster of Paris. So uh, around the 20s or so, uh, I forget the gentleman's name, came up with the idea of instead of lath and plaster, putting the gypsum in a paper sandwich, and, and that was the, the start of gypsum wallboard. After the war, when construction took off and they needed to find quicker ways to install things, paper wrapped gypsum board became the replacement for lath and plaster. And it has since become uh, ubiquitous. I mean, it's everywhere, and so it's prescribed in the building code. Um, the magnesium oxide cements have kept going in specific uses, but I guess until recently there hasn't been a big requirement for a replacement for gypsum. Now we're seeing more requirements because, um, well, people are starting to make um, gypsum from synthetic gypsum, which is generated from flue gas disulfurization, which uh, outgasses mercury and puts formaldehyde in your house. And so people like Continental, who are the new purchasers of the Lafarge Gypsum Organization, they market that as a recycled sustainable product, but it's actually relatively toxic. And in order to meet the new building code, gypsum keeps adding more additives to the product, and, and it isn't making it any better. Now, I think there's some interest in perhaps a replacement, but that's the way that the, the sort of history unfolded. And a lot of it, of course, is attached to the large money invested in the existing supply chain for both Portland cement and gypsum. When we went to get ICC certification, Hardy sent seven lawyers to say that magnesium oxide board shouldn't be allowed anywhere near North American construction. And so did the gypsum people. I mean, they really got their backs up thinking that competition was going to come in, and that's the unfortunate nature of um, capitalistic business in, in some respect. So I think this is, um, this is such a natural material that you can't really stop it. And it's, uh, the raw materials are available everywhere. And, and I think uh, it definitely does a much better job than the alternatives. We are, uh, as you probably gathered, um, in a pioneer stage. So I spent the first year, 18 months, doing these presentations. We've been specified in jobs. The pilot projects are now done. And so we're